Hey everyone, welcome to week 32. This is day four. This is Thursday. This is our primary color week. And we've changed our palettes up a little bit. Although today I'm also gonna use the palette that we used on Monday and that we used for uh, yesterday's painting of Alex Willoughby, which will be right here. Had a blast doing that painting. I always have fun painting painters that are friends and just pushing certain aspects of the painting. Today's painting is also gonna be that, and I think tomorrow's painting, I'm also gonna paint another artist friend. But um, it just gives me the opportunity to express through character. And I love to do that, especially with a limited palette. So let's see how we're gonna do today, bye. Okay, let's get started. Now for today, we are going to keep the same palette we had yesterday, which is uh, Monday's palette. So just to refresh everyone's memory, we're using primary colors, but we're trying to change the palette up just a little bit. We've only changed it once uh, during this week. I think I'm gonna change it also for uh, tomorrow, but for now, what we're gonna use today is titanium white, bismuth yellow, cad red, and uh, cobalt ultramarine. Again, this is the palette that we used on Monday for the painting we did of Danny, and this is the palette that we used yesterday for the painting that we did of Alex. I'm kind of understanding the palette, which means that I know of its limitations, but I also recognize the properties that are inherent to it. So limitations, we spoke about them yesterday. They have to do a little bit with value in the sense that we can't access a full range of value. We're not gonna be able to use a whole range of contrast based on the fact that if we want to uh, tint our darkest dark, if we want the hue of our darkest dark to be not blue, which is our darkest pigment, the minute we start mixing our yellow and red, that affects the overall value of that dark, which means that we are going to be working on a very specific range in terms of value. What would the workaround be if we wanted to use the uh, whole range of value? Well, we probably would um, need to accept that all our darks uh, would have to be either bluish or a bluish violet hue. If we are cool with that, then that's totally fine. If we wanted to make something earthier, it is inevitable that our value is going to be affected. So, you know, we have to deal with that. But I've come to accept that and I think I'm totally, totally fine with that. The reason that I've kept this one and I haven't, for example, gone back to the one that we used on Tuesday where we used quinacridone magenta is the fact that we can access broader possibilities in terms of temperature. Cat Red actually provides us with the warmness in this palette and that warmness was nowhere to be present when we use quinacridone magenta. So it's not that I didn't enjoy that palette. I think I had a blast working with that palette, especially with just that tinting strength of that magenta and the fact that that rose-ish hue just really, really affects a lot of your mixes. So I thought it was a really nice palette to work with, especially given the image that I was painting and having that really nice pinkish magenta-ish uh, mass that Vera was covered with. So yesterday we went back to the Cad Red primary color palette and today we're gonna do the same. I really feel that to understand a palette fully we need to do more than one exercise with it. Sometimes I feel very, very brave if I just do one painting with a weird color. I'm remembering those paintings that we did with these neon colors that were just insanely saturated. And those fluorescent colors are colors that I haven't really gone back to. And I know I had a blast working with them and they really felt super exciting, but I just don't lean naturally towards them. And if I have to be super honest, I don't know how much I truly understood them. I kind of found my way through the problem of trying to deal with them. But in order to really, really push the qualities that are inherent to those colors, I would have probably had to do, I don't know, 10 more paintings, 20 more paintings, just to really know what those colors are about. Anything else in my mind is just an introduction to that problem. It doesn't mean that I'm doing something superficial in order to solve that problem, but it probably means I'm skimming the surface. I'm beginning to understand something, but I would love to just say, okay, I'm gonna work with these colors for you know two months or for six months. 
then and only then I would say, yeah, I get it now. I kind of get how to push the most out of these colors. But for now, it's just a, a really nice experience. That first moment where we meet and you're able to do like a nice painting out of that first meeting, out of that blind date. But again, these are colors that I would I would have to go back to and then I would have to deeply explore in order to understand them as my own. I think the same thing happens with that uh, quinacridone magenta. I was like, yeah, I, I get it. I'm sensing what I can do with this color, but let me go back to my old faithful and let me go back to this uh, primary color palette that I've been using in the past three days because I want to try to understand how much I can push it. Today, it was fun because now that I have somewhat of a grasp of what I can do with the palette, again, the good and the bad, I can also say, okay, let's actually give ourselves some liberty. And I talked about this yesterday where if a palette, if a formal part of the execution of the painting is restricting, which the uh, you know four color palette could be defined as such, I actually tell myself, okay, if the parameters feel very evident, why don't you just you know push other parts of the painting? And I wanted to do that today and... Um, uh, I had a blast doing Alex's painting yesterday, which had like uh, this tiny little bit of wonk and distortion. And for today, I was like, yeah, let's actually have fun with this. This is where I feel most comfortable with. And I told myself, yeah, just push proportions. Not as crazy as the painting that I did of my mother, but let's try to see if we can manage some of the uh, natural distortions that are part of those uh, magnifying glasses. Let's echo that with the just subtle distortions in the uh, modeling of form and in the proportions within the face and in the proportions between the portrait and the rest of the body. And that to me is something that I just really enjoy. I think that I'm at my happiest there. When I don't have to question what I'm doing and I'm just reacting, I think that that's such an important part of painting also because you're giving yourself into the way you sensibly answer to something. And there's so much we can learn from that sole act of answering to something, not questioning why we're answering to something, but just saying, yeah, that feels like that. I'm going to paint it and I'm going to exaggerate it. And remember from the weeks past where we were talking about pushing stuff, the reason behind exaggerating something is that we're trying to communicate to ourselves that this was something that moved us. This aspect of what we were looking at in nature is something that was moving us. And we have to make a visual note that can serve as a reminder that this was relevant to us, that out of everything that composes that image that we have chosen and we have perceived, these little instances in our picture are the ones that truly, truly excite us and move us. And we have to find visual ways of communicating how they've moved us. So distortion, I feel, is a fantastic way to just throw out of balance, reorganize and rearrange the hierarchies that are natural in the relationships that we have with nature, in the way we organically occupy a space. There is a certain bit of harmony to that. And when we choose to distort, we are offsetting that harmony. We are almost rearranging nature in a way that we have to throw out the old rules that governed nature. And while we're painting our paintings, we are almost creating these new set of rules. That to me is incredibly exciting because even if we are just painting a figure, we are painting a figure that is symbolizing this new world. Those new laws that are affecting this world have affected this figure and have generated all these distortions. Whenever I, for example, lessen the structure, the inner structure of a body, I always feel that that body would belong to a world where there would be no gravity, you know, where there was no force that was pushing us downward. Because our bones and the, the mechanics of our body have to answer to gravity. So when we think of anatomy and we think of our muscles and our bones, we can't just think of that as if that existed in a void. We have to think of how those mechanics are actually necessary so that we can be erect and we can actually walk in the way we do. So I'd like to imagine when I'm distorting that... It's not just about saying, oh, I'm going to make a nose bigger and that's about it. But that because I'm choosing to rearrange, to reorganize 
those uh, building blocks of who we are. I can kind of imagine a world where that could be possible, where those uh, small new shapes and alterations can actually speak of a world, of a universe that would be entirely different from the one that we inhabit. It's a ton of fun when we choose to believe that a small change like that can have just this domino effect and speak about the uh, very nature of things and not just feel that, yeah, I'm just going to make a hand bigger just because. Those are very superficial things. But if there's a story, if you can imagine like a world that is embracing all these characters, then I think that that's the funnest part of doing this exercise. That's going to make it feel like it's alive. The humanity in this person is there because we can consider them as something that's plausible. That to me is why I find excitement in distortion and in just pushing character so much. I know we've talked about this painter that I'm going to reference today, but I talked about him when speaking about uh, still lifes. And even though I feel he is a tremendous still life painter, he is a tremendous landscape painter. He really is one of those artists that, in all honesty, should be bigger. He should be one of these names that we find synonymous with the 20th century. And it is uh, Haim Soutin. The most remarkable thing is that there was poetry to his uh, expressiveness. He was incredibly bold, insanely bold with his mark making. And his mark making would always have to do with character, was always subjected to character. His choice of wanting to exalt the human presence in his subject matter, the attitude behind the human being, and to put that at the top of his hierarchical scale, and to then build from that, that human being that he was going to portray is actually quite amazing. And that's why we get so, so many just wonderful, beautiful, almost organic distortions that are uh, inherent to his uh, portraiture. I think that it is no coincidence that he had that affinity with, with the working class, especially, you know, the bellboys and the pastry cooks that were part of those uh, 1920s French very glamorous hotels. It's kind of like the underbelly of those hotels, the part that was not glamorous. There was a very shiny, uh, superficial aspect to those spaces, but these were the people that actually had to work incredibly hard to maintain that uh, facade. And I feel that they they look like the people that would work insanely hard to try and maintain this this very superficial lie. And that's what you're getting very proud, sometimes tired sitters. And I, I think that that's fascinating. Sometimes we feel that we can access our humanity just by portraying the most beautiful aspects of who we are. But sometimes our best qualities have nothing to do with beauty or classical symmetry. Sometimes there's um, there's something gorgeous about vulnerability. And, and I think that that is what it's shown in these uh, paintings. So to me, Soutine is just... Pfft, for sure, one of the biggest painters in 20th century. And I think um, as time goes by, because we can't separate ourselves from time, but as we move along and as we can take a look back with um, fresh eyes and we can see the artist for what they were, I think Soutine is going to be this incredible painter that is going to be insanely respected and celebrated throughout the world. And I'm not saying that he's this obscure character, but for some reason, he does fall into a place where even though people may be familiar with him, they don't see him under the same light as um, very famous Impressionist and post-Impressionist painters. And he is that big. He really pushed painting forward. He does belong in that upper echelon of painters, certainly in the 20th century. What we're doing today is actually acknowledging that, yes, we have limitations, but no, we had a blast yesterday. And we pushed things in very subtle ways yesterday. And today we were going to try and push them even more. And I think that when we are enjoying our subject matter, we are also inherently enjoying our tools and the possibilities that stem from those tools. So if we're having a blast, I think it's going to show and the palette is never going to feel weird or limited. So that was it for today. Like I said, tomorrow, I think I'm going to change my whole palette up. We are actually going to change the yellow, the red, and the blue. We're actually going to introduce three new colors. So we'll see how that goes. And my expectation is that even though it's going to be a little bit different, 
Um, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to achieve some of the things that we've been able to get to during these past four days. But that's tomorrow, so we'll see how that goes. Thank you guys for hanging out. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.